Um, but in any event, Barnacle was always covering. Brian McGrory in the Globe wrote in his column that brotherly love explained why Billy was taking the fifth when asked to testify about his connections with his brother. So the Globe has been very credulous. But the other thing is, the New Yorker magazine published an incredibly dismal suck-up piece by Richard Brookheiser about Bill Bulger, and 60 Minutes, fearless 60 Minutes, did a did a terrific leprechaun number on Bill. I called Mike Wallace at the time because I knew they were working on it, and I said, Mike, you're from here. You know this is important. He said, I know, but it's morally safer story, and it was, it was obscene. Well, as you probably recall, Chris, uh, we sat in uh, the Channel 2 newsroom one afternoon, and it took us about 20 minutes to knock out a real 60-minute story, and we were using all video that had existed. <laughs> and I believe we, we told 60 Minutes that all this video existed but could uh, paint a damning portrait of, uh, of the corrupt midget, as Judge Dare called him, and uh, we, we never heard back from them. I, I think, though, locally what you have to remember, and I think the, the, the pivotal moment, and, and no one really wants to admit that this played uh, played a such a role on on many people paul corsetti uh he's now deceased he was a reporter for the herald american he was working on a story about a gangland slaying over there involving a a, a, a bookmaker turned drug dealer named louis Litoff. and he started asking questions about what happened he was uh he received an anonymous phone call and was invited down to a, a bar in, in quincy market for more information, he he was a Vietnam vet, a tough guy, second generation uh, street reporter for the Hearst organization. He shows up down there, and uh, he's sitting at the bar, and all of a sudden, uh, to make a long story short, he's confronted by Whitey Bulger, and Whitey says to him, you're, "I'm the guy who called you. I'm the guy you're looking for. I want to tell you a few things." Pulls a piece of paper out of his pocket, reads off the home address of Paul Corsetti reads off his license plate number make and model of his car his wife's license plate make and model and where his wife drops off his young daughter at daycare every day and says says that's all you need to know about me and then walks out of the bar next day I still remember it like it was yesterday Paul Corsetti shows up in the city room here at the Herald wearing a 38 caliber on his hip because he's he's that frightened he, they they go to the police department the police department say we've got whitey for 50 murders but we can't do anything so being an italian corsetti says well i'll play the ethnic card i'll go see larry bayoni the toughest uh, mafia enforcer the number two guy in the local lcn and uh larry says okay what can i do for you paul he says, I need a favor. He says, whatever you say. And he says, well, it's about Whitey Bulger. And, and Larry immediately goes, hey, he throws up his arms and says, hey, I can help you with anybody else, but not him. He, he's just bleeping crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then they finally got word back to him that they were just interested in Louis Litiff, that, that they weren't interested in the brother. Apparently, Whitey was concerned that Paul was going after Billy Bulger. And they got the whole thing straightened out. But you know what, Chris, for five years... There was next to nothing that appeared in, in either paper about Whitey and Billy. And those were pivotal years. Those were the years when, he, uh, when, when Billy went after uh, Johnny Powers, the uh, clerk of the Supreme Judicial Court in Suffolk County, for firing Whitey from his job. That's the same Johnny Powers, former Senate president, who said to me one time, Chris, it's exactly as if... Al Capone's brother was the president of the Illinois State Senate, and everybody agreed just not to talk about it. Yeah. They, they just they they operated with impunity. I mean, the the story that I always remember. I worked at Channel 56, which is right next to the Globe, so I would have to go between here in the South End and Dorchester, and I would have to go the the most direct way is right by the liquor store Whitey owned. And for some reason, when I'd finish up work at Channel 56, I would never get a cold one for the ride home at the South Boston Liquor Mart. And one night they mentioned that to uh, to Jack Hines, the son of the mayor, and he was the anchor man at Channel 56. And uh, I guess probably it was probably Kevin Weeks, one of their uh, the grave digger for the mob, who was behind the uh, counter. And he said, "Hey, Jack, how come Howie never comes in here?" And Jack kind of you know gave it a sh gave it a shrug. And uh, and and whoever it was said. Will you tell Howie that if he comes in here, we'll be ready for him. We got a new dumpster right out back with his name on it. It'll be another Robin Benedict. Well, you know, this is this gets serious, Howie, because every reporter knew the Paul Corsetti story. In some in some versions, 
Whitey said to him, my name is Whitey Bulger, I kill people for a living. But everybody was scared, everybody was terrified, terrorized, and it worked for him. How did it affect you? Did it scare you? Oh yeah, it scared me, definitely. I. I used to go home a different way every night. I, I was uh, I, I was concerned, you, you know. After, and then I I wrote the first story after Corsetti for Boston Magazine, and I thought that the Globe was working on a story too. So I didn't think I didn't realize I'd be hanging out there all by myself in Boston Magazine. And then then we get the word from the quote unquote FBI, which I now know was Connolly, saying tell Howie to watch his step in South Boston. And and Kevin Cullen from the Globe got the same thing. You know, he gets a call from uh, Tom Daly, who's again one. One of the one of the uh, one of the fringe Connolly Morris type agents at the office, and uh, he he's told he's told well if you write a story saying that uh, Whitey is an informer for the FBI, you know he knows where you live in South Boston and he and he could kill you. So he, yeah, I mean that's pretty frightening. I mean even even if you suspect that they're just bragging about their right. prowess, you know you you can't these these are guys who in in one week. One year, and I think it was 1973. They machine gunned two people, and and they were on major, not on, not on side streets. One of them, was, they machine gunned a guy on Morrissey Boulevard, and the, and four days earlier they'd machine gunned somebody else on on Commercial Street in the North End. I mean, they, they were they they walked into a uh, in, into a coffee shop in downtown Medford Square. And uh, and blew somebody away in front of a dozen witnesses. You're right. And I knew Don Colleen, who was supposed to be the toughest guy. I mean, he was the toughest guy I ever met. Huge, ham-handed, had the uh, the, the the booking uh, exclusive in Upton's Court and whatnot. Everybody I knew thought he was the toughest guy in the world. Killed, presumably by Whitey Bulger, in his own front yard in Framingham because Whitey wanted the corner. Uh, and even I, I remember a state cop giving me directions actually one fourth of july my daughter was in the car and he said senator bulger will be waiting for you at the uh, at the end of the longfellow bridge that was supposed to be a joke i guess but you know they were all watching <laughs> yeah and and it uh, and it it um it it helped billy bulger you know you have the famous quote from uh, from from kevin white about how uh, if you know if my brother threatened to kill you you'd be nothing but nice to me and right. you know they people people knew that and that's another part of the joke that uh, that people went along with uh, I, I won't say who it was but a world famous stage director said to me one time he was fascinated by the Bulger story I said why you live in Los Angeles you work all around the world and he said no it's so interesting I read the papers and what's so obvious to me is that the so-called good brother is in truth the really, really bad brother. There's no separation between the two, and it's Billy who's reaping the fruit. Yeah, I, I remember uh, one time being out on a boat with uh, Jerry and Delicato, and it turned out it was he was a crooked Dukakis guy who ended up going to jail shortly thereafter. And uh, he he was on the boat with uh, me and uh, Frank Phillips, now of the Globe and formerly of the Herald, and and. Uh, and Delicato looked at me and said, do, "Do you know how much Senate President Bulger would give me?" to throw you off this boat and he was half half serious and uh, half kidding I should say but maybe there was just a, a grain of truth to what he was saying and then then later on I find out that he he is the nephew of Teddy Deegan the the mob the fringe mobster that the FBI framed sent four innocent men to death row back in 1968 for just to just to take mafia people off the street, and that's and again, this it all comes back to 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 J. Edgar Hoover getting the directive, I think, from from RFK in 1961, saying you got to go after the mafia, and once they said once they said that any ends justified the means to get rid of the get rid of the mafia, that's what that's what unleashed this this hurricane in in the city of Boston. Let's talk about the other heroes in this story. I mean, you're number one in my book because you've written about it fearlessly. You've made it funny, but you've made it real over many, many years. Uh, I give Judge Mark Wolf very high points for blowing the whistle on the FBI. I mean, he was in the prosecutor's office when it was being compromised, and then, but then went back and and insisted on hearings about it. Uh, George Dare, the original housing court victim of Bulger, spoke up. Michael McDonough wrote a very illuminating book called All Souls about about the terror in South Boston and then Dick Lair 
and Jerry O'Neill at the Globe did a good book called Black Mass on it. Who else do you put on the uh, in the honor roll? Or just people who stood up? Well, Chris, you should be on the honor roll. You really should. No, because you, I mean, you you uh, you guys you let's let's not uh, forget what happened at Channel 2's 10 o'clock news because after after you and uh, David Boeri, who definitely should be on the list, you guys went after uh, Bulger big time, and you as a public. Uh, broadcasting entity, you you uh, were at risk, perhaps more than some of the rest of us. And as we know, the Channel Two had a uh, had a had a yearly auction. They needed a liquor license. Some of uh, you guys had a problem getting the liquor license, didn't you? Well, I was enjoined uh, against mentioning Mr. Bolger on the air, and I said this is absurd. And then, uh, and I, I, you know, won't have any part of the the, uh, the injunction. Suddenly, <laughs> the ten o'clock news was history. It was over. But, uh, that's a heavy price to pay. Lose your job. I give you another example of a guy who who almost paid a heavy price, lost his job. Was uh, State Police Colonel Jack O'Donovan. This is a guy they went after, hammer and tong to get him off because he was an honest cop. He put the he he put the bug in the Lancaster Street garage in 1980. And uh, what what was his reward? A, a, a surreptitiously filed outside section to the budget that would have forced him and three other State senior state police officers to retire and uh, give Governor King credit. He he vetoed that. And and you know the odd thing is for all the grief that Ed King took as uh, being a troglodyte uh, Democrat, uh, Ed K uh, Ronald Reagan's favorite Democratic governor, et cetera, et cetera. Ed King stood up more to Billy Bulger and the the mob than Mike Dukakis did, I believe. And so in the end, did Tom Riley, the AG. I mean, proving that an Irishman could stand up. Tom Tom Riley had a lot to answer for after he took a hundred dollar contribution from Zip Connolly in his first race for Attorney General. In my my point, in my estimation, however, he did he did realize the enormity of his error. Shall we say he returned the money and uh, turned turned on Bulger with a vengeance? Is the nightmare over? You still on your wonderful web page, HowieCard dot com, which I got to mention, um, you have a wonderful picture of. Uh, the putative nominee of the Democratic Party, John Kerry, in one of those laugh-it-up moments with Bill Bulger in uh, South Boston. Uh, does he have any hold on anybody anymore? Chris, I don't think he does. I, you know, I, I, I like that photograph, and I would advise anyone who, who enjoys uh, who enjoys old-time photos and old-time FBI memos to go to HowieCard.com and check, click on the Whitey Watch, and you'll see all that stuff. However, I, I had an, an incident recently. One of his brother-in-law, one of the one of the last of his generation of Bulgers on the on the state payroll, retired from his job as head of the environmental police. Again, he's 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 not connected, but still, it's rather odd. The green have, Bulger to have to have a Bulger <laughs> running any kind of police force, even a green police force. <laughs> However, he, he retired, and I got a call a couple of days after I wrote a column about it, saying saying another Bulger had gone on to a, to a major pension, and said, "Howie, they've just rehired him as a consultant." And I thought to myself, "Isn't that 1987?" And I must admit, I believed it was true, and uh, I uh, I immediately started making calls. And guess what? It's not true. They did not give this. Bulger in-law Bill McKeon a chance to make even more though he's he's retired permanently thanks in major part to you Howie Carr I, I think it's a huge credit to you that you've Come just on, hung Chris, in straight on the on the straight uh, well I, I, I was a very minor player there uh, it did cost me but uh, you were out there calling him the corrupt midget in the great words of George Dare all those years the CM and Whitey you called the Caucasian that took a lot of wit and a lot of guts over many years. Howie Carr, thank you. Chris, as I always used to tell you, you know, when you'd say, you'd say, I'm very worried, and I'd say, Chris, if he, he's, gonna, he's in triple O's. He's going to kill me first. He'll kill me. You'll hear about it on the radio while he's driving over to your place. Chris Lydon wounded by shrapnel in <laughs> Howie Carr assassination. Howie, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Howie, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Howie, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Howie, thank you. Thank you, Chris.